All right, chapter number 22. As I've mentioned previous weeks, I'm excited to get into the, the stories of Josiah. I'm glad there's not only just one chapter where we're going over the works of Josiah. Uh, actually, next week I'm even more excited for than this week because we really get into a lot more of the meat of what he does. But uh, let's, let's start off here. Verse number one, the Bible says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. Now, just a recap, if you weren't here last week or if you don't remember, Josiah is the son of Manasseh. Manasseh was a really wicked king and he was the son of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was another great king. So, um, actually, no, I get, I, 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 let me correct myself. Josiah is not the son of Manasseh. Josiah is Manasseh's grandson. The, the son of Manasseh is, uh, only reigned for like two years and he was, and he was murdered. Uh, Ammon, that's right, Ammon came after Manasseh and then Josiah. But Ammon, Ammon gets like almost no mention in the Bible. So he's, he's just there. He was wicked like Manasseh was. But remember, Manasseh repented and got right with God at the end of his life after he'd done all the wickedness and filled the land with blood and everything else. He, he finally repented. His son didn't. His son was, was brought up in, in the, the wicked ways. He was wicked. But now we have a young Josiah. And remember, he's not the only king to have started very young in life being a king. He started when he was eight years old because his father only reigned for two years and was killed. So, so of course, he's going to be a lot younger. And he also had a significant reign. I mean, 31 years is a pretty long time to reign as a king. So um, he was eight years old. He did that which was right. He's a really godly, righteous man. And, and I want you to keep your place here and turn if you would to 2 Chronicles 34 because we're going to get a little bit of extra information on just some of the things where his heart was and some of the things he did prior to turning 18. Because um, the next verse in verse 3 of 2 Kings, it tells us, it, 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 not when he turned 18, in the 18th year of King Josiah. So like, um, we're, we're, there's a lot more that happens up until this point in 2 Chronicles 34. So we're going to read 2 Chronicles 34 just to get that little bit of extra information about King Josiah's life. Uh, we're going to start reading in verse number 1, 2 Chronicles 34. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left, just like we just read. Verse number 3, for in the eighth year of his reign, so while he was yet young. Now, this is important, just a real quick note. I didn't even have this in my notes, but he started to reign when he was eight years old, and in the eighth year of his reign puts him at 16, right? So the Bible says while he was yet young. So he's still, being 16 is still considered young, even in Bible time. You know, a lot of people want to tell you, oh, well, in those days, you know, a 16-year-old was like a grown man. It's like, no. It's, you know, he still was yet young. And that's what the Bible says here. And we, we could get that pretty easily. But um, don't, and I, it's not like I've heard that a whole lot. But, I, but I, you know, people always want to tell you different things about the way things were back then when they have no idea the way things were. But we know that God's word is true. And if the Bible is saying while he was yet young, 16-year-olds young. Sorry, 16-year-olds, but you're still young. <laughs> you may think you know everything right now, but you don't. Um, but anyways, so we're going to see we're going to see a little bit of the heart even while he was yet young. Now we're going to see here uh, in verse three he began to seek after the God of David his father. So this is when he's searching for God, and this is when he he really is is kind of coming to his own senses on on what he believes, right? Because his father and his grandfather were both wicked. Now his grandfather repented late in life, so we don't know. Maybe his, maybe Manasseh had an influence as he was only eight years old on his early years. Don't know. Don't, don't have a way of knowing that. After, you know, after he repented while he was just growing up real young. But he didn't seek the God of Manasseh either. He seeked the, the God of David, his father, is what the Bible says here. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. So after four, after four years of, you know, he started to search, figure out, you know, I was trying to seek out God get to know God a little bit more, you know, the God of David, his father, the real God, the Lord. And after learning whatever he could in four years, he decided, you know what? 
He's a king, 20 years old. I'm going to make a stand. And it says that's when he started to um, purge Jude and Jerusalem. Because remember, I mean, Manasseh brought in all kinds of garbage. I mean, he polluted the house of the Lord. He brought in all these altars. He brought in all these false gods. You're worshiping the host of heaven and all kinds of garbage. Just, just the, the, all the stuff that Hezekiah had eliminated, Manasseh just brought it all back and then some and just, just totally brought in a lot. So now we have Josiah going back and clearing house again and saying, let's, let's purge. Let's get rid of this stuff. We don't need this stuff. So it says here, um, you know, the high places, the groves, the carved images, the molten image, all the idolatry that was in the land. He's getting rid of that. Verse four, and they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence. So, I mean, he, he, he's sincere. Josiah's a sincere guy. He's not just like, um, you know, he's not just like your average politician. He, he decided for himself that he's going to believe on the Lord. He decided to get things done. And he's saying, you know what? I want you tearing this stuff down. And they did it in his presence. He was, he was right there when they took everything down. He made sure it got done. It says, and the images that were on high above them, he cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images, he break in pieces and made dust of them and strewed it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. So the graves of the Baal worshipers, you know, the priests or whatever, he desecrated their graves by burning down all these ashes, you know, burning down all their altars and, and images. And he's saying, we're going to throw these ashes on their graves. You know, they, they can deal with this. They can be cursed for, for worshiping all these false gods and being Satan worshipers. And that's what he did. And this is, this is a great stand that he took, even as a young man, as a young king, as a young ruler, coming after wicked people. I mean, he was raised in a wicked household. And what I like to see about this is that, you know, we saw the failure of Hezekiah with his raising of Manasseh, his inability to raise up a godly son, even though he himself did many godly things, many godly works, was, you know, did a lot of work himself, his inability to raise a son, so you could grow up in a good household. You could have a good dad, you could have a good mom, but you still have to decide for yourself what do you believe, and ultimately God holds you responsible for your own actions anyways. But on the flip side, you can grow up in a wicked household and still turn out to be really good and on fire for God too. You know, don't think that, oh, well, just because I grew up in this situation, all is lost. Right. I mean, we were, you, you may not have as good of a start, that's for sure. But Josiah didn't come from the greatest home. His dad was wicked. His grandfather was wicked for almost all of his life. Not the best place to grow up. And, and he grew up with all this Balaam worship and these altars and everything else. But he still got right with God and, and, and made a, a strong move. I mean, we were talking to people just on Sunday that, that were, came out of the fundamental Mormon group from uh, that, um, what's his name? Jeffs, the, uh, the, the, fundament, the guy that's in prison now, Warren Jeffs. They were, they were in that cult. They grew up in that as kids. And, uh, you know, I... Uh, hopefully they weren't abused, but I know there's a lot of child abuse and all kinds of other g garbage going on there, but that's not a good upbringing. But you know what? Those guys still have a chance. Those guys can be like a Josiah. Even though they might have had really bad upbringings, they can still turn things around themselves. Why? Because they have a choice to make. Josiah had a choice to make. He sought out the God of David, his father, not the God of Ammon, his father. He sought out the true God. And anybody that seeks out the true God can, can do great things, can be a Josiah. But you have to then decide to actually do something with it. You know, a lot of people get saved. A lot of people believe. But not many people then turn that belief in action and actually start doing the works. And it's, you know, that's where we want to be. But let's, let's keep reading here a little bit more about Josiah and what he did. Um, Verse number five, and he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. Again, he dug up the bones of the, of the priests, the Baal-worshipping priests, not the priests of the Lord. Baal-worshipping priests, and he burned them on, on their Baal-worshipping altars. And uh, that's how he cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. Verse number six, and so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even unto Naphtali, with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves, and had beaten the graven images into powder and cut down 
all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land, so now he's 26, he started doing this up when he was 20, so now we're jumping forward to when he's 26 years old, the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Maasai, the governor of the city, and Joel, the son of Jehoaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. Let's go back to 2 Kings 22. We're gonna, this is basically where we're picking up the story now. We didn't get all those other details of him cleansing Judah and Jerusalem and all the things with the altar and stuff, but it's important, I think, that we bring that up since we're going over Josiah's life in this chapter. And we see that he started even from a young man, you know, 16 years old is when he decided to kind of start seeking after God. And that's, that's when, you know, came into his mind and he started searching. By the time he was 20, I mean, after only four years of, you know, obviously seeking and finding whatever he needed to find, he said, like, you know what, this is, you know, God's a true Lord and, and we're going we're gonna to clean up, clean up ship here. And that's exactly what he did. So let's uh, continue in 2 Kings 22, verse number 3. The Bible says, And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshullam, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord and let them give it to the doers of the work, which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house unto carpenters and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. Now, this isn't the first time this has happened. If it sounds familiar to you, it's because it is. This has already happened once before where the king has to step in and be like, hey guys, let's repair the house of God. Like, what are you doing? You know, the priests and the Levites, like, and, and you remember last time they, the, the priest took the money and they still didn't do anything with it. And the king's like, all right, we're going to put these lock boxes up here. You're not taking the money. We're going to put it all in there. And then whatever money goes in there, you know, because they were supposed to do the work and they just didn't do it. They were collecting their paycheck and not doing the work. So now they still have the system to say, okay, well, hey, let's get that silver. Let's get that money that's come in and let's repair the house. Let's, let's fix this place up. And basically this is where Josiah is. There's a lot of knowledge he doesn't have yet. He decided to seek after God and he's doing the best that he can and he's getting rid of the, the false gods of the land and he's doing a good job with that and, and now he decides, hey, this, this place is kind of beat up. Let's, let's fix this place back up again. Let's, let's get our building project with our thermometer on the wall. Let's raise the funds and get this, get this building going and that's, that's what he did here. He repaired the breaches. He, you know, his He's saying, deliver, get the money to the people that need to do the work and let's get this place fixed up. Verse number eight, and Hilkiah the high priest said unto shape and the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. So this is something that, I mean, this is always really interesting to me. This has stuck out in my mind since probably the first time I read it, how they're like, you know, the, the, the house of the Lord's kind of in disarray. It's falling apart. And he's like, you know what? We need to fix this place up. Go in there, you know, get everything fixed, get the carpenters, you know, get some wood, get the stone, hewn stone, everything needs to fix it. And as they're, they're working, they're fixing it, they're like, hey, you know, what's, what's this here? Love, mo oh, hey, look at it. We found the law of the Lord. We, fo <laughs> we, we, found, we found the Bible. It's like, what have they been doing this whole time? Where's that thing been? And yet, there's a lot of Christians that probably feel the same way when they walk across their bookshelf or they're moving and they're packing things up and they're like, oh, hey, look, it's my Bible. And you know what? That's a shame. It's a shame because you don't know, you don't know anything about God if you're not reading your Bible. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing. Up to this point, Josiah was all about the building fund and you know, doing his best to serve God, but without the word of God. Now think about how hard that would be if you just, if you had a desire, you actually had the right God, you knew enough to know who God was, you knew enough about the Lord, but you're trying to serve him now and you're trying to get things done right and you don't even have the Bible. 
And you know what? There's a lot of churches out there that are doing the same thing. They, they're either using a perversion of God's word or they're doing the, let's pick out one verse from Psalms or Proverbs or whatever and then just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk about everything else but God's word. And this is how, and they have all these activities, they have all these programs, they got everything going on and you find none of it in scripture. And almost nothing they do is found in Scripture because they're not going out and preaching the gospel. Most of them aren't even singing the, 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 the hymns and the spiritual songs. You know, they're, they're just singing rock songs with Jesus words put to it. Why? Because they're not looking to the law of the Lord. They don't have it. I mean, it, good luck finding it. They, they probably don't even have the physical book because they're using their, their, their big screen up on the wall or whatever where no one even has to bring in their book, bring in their Bible to check these things and make sure they're so. Oh, no, just, just follow it here. Look at verse number nine. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king, and it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. So they finally bring the king word again. Remember the king ordered everything to be fixed, you know, do this. The last thing he expected was for this to happen. So they bring him, they're like, hey, we found a book. Hey, we found the law of the Lord. So they read it to him. Then they, they, they go through the law of Moses. They, you know, they, they read the Bible to him, the, the Bible that they had up to that point. And he hears it, and it, it bothers him. He's upset. He's so upset, he, he tears his clothing. And that's something that people did when they were grieving, when they were sad, or when they, you know, they would throw dust, or they'd wear sackcloth, right? They'd rend their clothes. They'd be upset, and that's how they humbled themselves, right? So the king's probably wearing some fancy clothes because he's the king, and he tears it, right? He, he, he ruins it, and he's humbling himself before God. And... What separates Josiah from most other people, saved and unsaved alike, I mean, even, you know, even, unfortunately, even a lot of saved people, is that when he heard the word of God, he didn't scoff at the word of God, he didn't make fun of it, he didn't try to, he didn't try to explain it away and say why they really were good and, and he was still real righteous and everything was going to be okay somehow and try to twist what God's word said and, and make up some excuse for what the law says. That's not what he did. That's what a lot of people want to do when they hear God's word, especially when they're guilty of something. That's not what he did. He realized, he said, we've been wrong. We are wrong about this. The fathers have been really bad and really wrong. He didn't see, with how, we read what Manasseh did and it's like, how could they have fallen so far, so fast, and have done all this wickedness and passing children through the fire and filling the land with innocent blood? And to Josiah, he didn't even realize how bad it was. And that's the problem when you don't read your Bible, when you're not getting in this book, when you're not getting God's perspective on things. As the world goes to hell, you don't think things are really that bad. You may realize something's wrong. You might realize, you know what? That's not right. No, we're not going to worship these false gods. We're going to worship this God. But you, but you still don't re quite realize how bad it really is until you get in this book, until you get into God's word. And Josiah heard it. And he humbled himself. and He's like, wow, we're in big trouble. Humbly accepting God's word when you hear what it actually says. And that's what we need to be able to do as Christians. It don't matter what it is. And it might sting when you, when you hear some, some places read that that's not the way that you thought. I mean, one of the big things today is just, I mean, even with, with dealing with people, you know, with the, with the sodomites, with the homosexuals, there's so many people have this soft spot because they've been brainwashed by the world and they're not reading their Bibles. They're not reading Genesis. They're not reading the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah. They're not reading the stories in Judges 19. They're not reading what they do and, who, and, and, and how they are. They're not reading Jude. They're not reading 2 Peter chapter 2. They're not reading 
all of these various books of the Bible, Romans 1, that talk so strongly and how vile and wicked and disgusting this stuff is, and because now they know people. And we're going to see next week, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to get into this too much, we're going to see what, what Josiah does in response to this. And he gets the sodomites out of the land. And it's a righteous thing to do. But I don't want to get too far, because I'm, I'm waiting until next week to preach on that, so I'm going to hit that hard. Why? Because it needs to be hit hard. Because people don't have the attitude that Josiah had. And they hear the hard preaching, and it turns them away, and it rubs them the wrong way. And you know what? God's word says what it says, and I'm not going to make excuse or apology for it. Amen. When the Bible says, thou shalt beat thy son with the rod, thou shalt beat him. There's no explaining that away. It says what it says. You either accept it or you don't. Maybe you haven't been doing things right. Why don't you humble yourself and say, well, that's what the Bible says. You know, I'm going to turn there. Proverbs 23, real quick. Because I don't want to misquote it. I've got it memorized, but I don't want to misquote it. Let me introduce you to the Bible. We'll dust it off in case you haven't been reading it enough. Here. You know, and it's in the Old Testament, which makes it probably even worse, right? The pages are all brand new. Hard to, hard to get them unstuck together because you got that brand new book. You've never gone to the Old Testament before. Proverbs 23. Verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. The Bible says what it says. It's there. And it's up to us just to accept it and say, wow, I, I, I don't like when kids get spanked with the rod. I don't, I don't like that. Well, I, don't, I don't necessarily like it either. But you know what? I'm going to do what the Bible says. And it says, and, and you know what? I believe the Bible when it says, if you, if you beat your child with a rod, you're going to deliver their soul from hell. I believe that. Do I have to understand exactly all the in and outs of, of how that's going to play out in their life and in the future? I don't. I don't have to understand it. But if the Bible says it, I believe it. And it's not that difficult to understand. It's not that difficult to understand that you need to give children correction and punishment when they break your commandments, when they break your laws, there is a consequence. That's not just being a little bit bored and sitting in a corner. Because God doesn't put people in purgatory or in time out when they break his laws. God's punishment is hell. And that hurts and it stings and it burns. And when you spank your child on the rear end, when you beat him with the rod like in that manner, they're going to feel the stinging and the burning. And it's going to be a really small taste, but you know what? It's, it's enough. It's enough for them to realize when I do wrong, when I break the rules, when I'm wrong, there's going to be a punishment and it's not going to feel good. And it's not something I could just daydream about and just play in my head or whatever because I'm facing a corner. It's real. And from a young age, when you start to get that through your head, you, you, it's not that hard to grasp, hey, hell's a real place. Yeah. This is the reality that I know. Hell is real. You want to know how they're going to deliver? Do you, do you have to spank your child for them to be saved and go to heaven? Well, you're going to deliver their soul from hell. I mean, that's not, part, that's not the plan of salvation. You obviously have to put their faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. But there's, there goes a long way to, to getting him to that point. That's why it says that it's not that difficult to understand. But when people want to just change what the Bible literally says into it, meaning, well, it's just talking about discipline in any form. It's just saying you have to, to teach them right from wrong. That's not what it's saying. It says, thou shalt beat him with the rod. That's what it says. And anyone that wants to say it says otherwise is a liar. 
Let's just believe the book for what it says, like Josiah did. He heard it, and he was like, oh man, we screwed up. God's right. We're wrong. Let's get right with God. What can we even do about this? And see, when he heard, and, and think about it, when he heard, he already knew. He didn't need anyone else to tell him. He didn't have to go. So he seeks out counsel. He seeks a prophet because he wants to hear from the Lord, not because he needs more understanding of, well, what was the culture really like when Moses was around? He didn't need someone to try to tell him why they were actually okay and God's law didn't really apply to them. That's not what he was seeking. He could understand that for himself because it's pretty straightforward. We could understand that for ourselves too. You don't need some teacher or some theologian to tell you what the, what the law really means. God wrote it pretty simple so that we could all understand it. So you could pick up the book and read it and understand, yep, that's a sin. Yep, that's wrong. Yep, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Not that hard. But when Josiah seeks counsel, he's seeking counsel because he wants to know how bad is it really? Is there anything that we can do? You know, what can we do, God? We're sorry. We want to get right with you. You know, have mercy on us. This is, this is what he's seeking. He already knows it's wrong. He already knows everybody's screwed up big time. So now he's just trying to get a little bit more word from the Lord and say, God, we're sorry about this. We didn't know or what, you know, whatever. What can we do to get this right? That's what he was seeking. He was seeking the, the what now. It's clear that it was wrong. He's trying to make amends and see what can we do about this. That's why he seeks out to get more information and seeks out a prophet. And honestly, you know, hopefully that's, that's what I help to do here at church. You should know for yourself right from wrong. You should know what a sin is and what is not in general. I mean, you could, you could read the Bible for yourself. I might help make some extra applications of God's word to things that go on in our lives or might try to, to give a little bit of wisdom and knowledge on, on how to deal with things. At maybe after the fact or before the fact, try to prevent things, but you could read this book and know right from wrong. You don't need me to tell you that. Look at verse number 12. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Ezahiah a servant of the kings, saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me. It means question. You know, go seek out God. Get, get counsel from God. And for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. He's treating this serious. He's saying, I know that there's wrath from God. He, he have to, he's not questioning that. Is God angry about this stuff? Yes, it's obvious because he said not to do any of these things that have been done. Of course God's angry, but now he's just seeking the counsel, saying, hey, what can we do? Verse number 15, or excuse me, 14. So Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam and Akbor and Shaphan and Azahiah went unto Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, the son of Harhaz, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. Now I'm going to take a, a pause here just real briefly, and I want to explain something about just college in general. This is one of two places the word college is found in the Bible. The only other place that it's even referenced is in the parallel passage in 2 Chronicles, where it's telling the same exact story. So it's not a different reference technically. You know, it's still the, the same story. And it's, and it's just referring to this woman, this prophetess, that lived at the college. The reason why I'm even bringing this up is because these days what churches have done is, is taking an institution from the world and brought it into the church and they're using this model to, to train pastors. And, and they brought in something that's extra biblical, something that the world came up with. The public education system and university is not something that's found in Scripture. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for education and learning and knowing and wisdom. I mean, the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all that wisdom, get understanding. Right? I mean, we, 
Yeah, we need knowledge. We need, we need wisdom. We ne I'm all for that. Let's learn as much as we possibly can. But I'm not going to go to a godless institution to get my source of knowledge. I'm not going to go and, and, and or model myself after a godless institution in order to bring that in to the church and use that model for our teaching training. See, people come in from time to time and say, oh, so where did you go to school? And what they mean is, where did I go to, to seminary or what type of you know, school did I go to to get my pastor, you know, my doctorate degree or pastorate or whatever that they give out? And, and because so many places now, so many churches and so many denominations, Christians, whatever you want to call it, have followed the model of secondary education where you go to Bible college, is what they call it. And you study for four years or however long, however long they're their program lasts and you get these titles and they're the same titles as the world. Doctor, master, bachelors, right? I mean, you get these things. That's what the world uses. It's like Roman. It's like from, from, from the Greeks or the Romans that that, that system of just of, of, of getting these titles and things attached to your name. It's not from God. It's not of the Bible. That's why, that's why I don't believe in going to Bible college at all. I don't believe in setting up an institution where all of these people that want to pastor churches can all get indoctrinated in one place from a group of different teachers or professors or whatever. You know, and, and, and master, the Bible says not to be called master because one is your master, even Christ. Not to be called father, not to be called rabbi, and not to be called master. And you think that that's godly to go and get a master's degree so you could be master of theology or the study of God, or master of divinity, of the divine, and that's not prideful? Are you really a master of these things? But in their zeal to be like the world, this is what people expect now. What Bible college did you go to? You know, I didn't go to Bible college, and I have no problem with that. I'm actually glad I didn't go to Bible college. What we see from Scripture is there is no institution that's set up. We see the institution of the church, we see an institution of the family, and we see an institution of government set up in God's Word. That's the institutions that we see and nothing else. When the Bible gives children unto people, He gives them unto you to raise and to teach and to train and to talk to them day and night when you go by the way and when you lay down and when you rise up and everything else. That's your job as parents. That's under the family institution. And things that, that when churches beget church, guess what? That happens within the church institution. And he's given some evangelists and pastors and teachers and apostles for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. He didn't say, and professors and masters of divinity and Bible colleges. And you're not going to see that anywhere. You know who he used to do his work? Fishermen. Shepherds, people plowing with an ox, regular laborers. That's who he used. Think about Elijah. What was Elijah doing? He was plowing with the ox, right? When Elijah came by and called him to do the work of the Lord. Did he send him off to some school? So No, he learned from Elijah. He was a servant to Elijah until it was time for him to step up and do the job. The, the, the apostles they were fishermen. They were out working, and Jesus called them, and what did they do? Did he send them off to the, to the Pharisees and to the, to the, to the uh, synagogue to go get studied up and to learn and to learn letters and to learn all this stuff, and then they could teach people? No. They just spent time with Jesus, and Jesus taught them. And that's why the Bible says that, that they marveled when they took note that he had been with Jesus because they were like, these people don't know letters, but how are they speaking so boldly? How is it that they're able to teach all these great truths and doctrines and stuff? Why? Because they were with Jesus. And that's what you need to do. If you want to be a teacher of God's word, you have to know God's word. You don't have to know all the culture and all the history and everything outside of the Bible in order to be a pastor, in order to teach other people the Bible. What you're going to get when you get that is the world's wisdom, the world's philosophy. And how do you even know if any of that stuff is even right? 
They're going to try to tell you that 2,000 years ago, men wore dresses and that, and, and that was the culture and that was acceptable and that's fine. You know what? Maybe men did wear dresses, but you know what? It still wasn't right. Jesus didn't wear a dress. But this is the type of teaching you get. And it's like, well, where is that in the Bible? Nowhere. There's one other place where the Bible references school. And that's found in the book of Acts, chapter 19. And we'll see if this is, just think of yourself, is this a positive or a negative reference to just the word school? College is mentioned twice. We already saw one here. And, and, and nothing good or bad just said. It's just, that's just where she dwelt, where Hold of the Prophetess lived at the college. Not saying we should do it. Just, that's it. <clears throat> Excuse me. School is in Acts 19, 9. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So the disciples are arguing. They're disputing in this school. So the disciples are right. They've got the truth. They've got the word of God. It doesn't sound like this Tyrannus school, the Tyrannus school Rex, not having the right doctrine or the truth or anything. Why? Because they're disputing. They're arguing. It doesn't sound like the place I want to be. So nowhere in Scripture are you going to find anything else that says uh, you know, school or college. Now, people will make references to the school of the prophets. Oh, the school of the prophets. And, and people bring this up. And, and, and other Baptist churches and other churches will say, but there was a school of the prophets. What about that? Well, when they reference the school of the prophets, if they use that phrase, that is not coming from the King James Bible, first of all. They're already in error just using some false version of the Bible. Because you could find that phrase in a modern perversion, but you're not going to find it in the KJV. And what they, what they translate as the school of the prophets is they're referring to the sons of the prophets. Now, do you remember, because we're in the book of 2 Kings, we saw some of the sons of the prophets. So when Elisha was walking with Elijah, and Elijah was about to be taken up, taken up to heaven by a whirlwind, as they were going, the sons of the prophets were talking to Elijah saying, don't you know that your master is going to be taken away from you this day? And he's like, I know it, I know it, you know, like hold your peace. And, and as they're going around, the sons of the prophets were kind of standing afar off and they're watching everything happening from a distance as Elisha is right there with Elijah. Elijah gets taken up, Elisha comes back, he parts the sea, he, you know, the, the Jordan River, he, go, he crosses over and then, you know, the sons of the prophets are there and they see all this stuff, whatever. And then um, in 2 Kings 6, we saw the story about the sons of the prophets where they were dwelling with Elisha, they were living with him. And that's when, the, the, with the story of the, the axe head coming off, you know, and they're, they're chopping the trees. And he's like, oh, master is borrowed, you know, and he, and he made it to swim the, the axe head and he's able to grab it, whatever. In 2 Kings 6, verse 1, and it, just to show you this reference, because this is going to be the, the most evidence anyone is going to be able to show you to try to justify Bible college, because it's not found in Scripture anywhere. 2 Kings 6, 1 says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elijah, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us, or too narrow. There's a lot of them, right? And they're getting too big for the place they're living in. Verse 2, Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So there's, he's saying, they come to him and saying, Hey, this place isn't big enough for all of us. Let's go somewhere else and we can all live over there. And he's like, go ahead. Just go. You go and do that. He didn't even want to do that. He's not running some school when he's telling them as they're growing, hey, we got even more people here. Let's all go live somewhere else now. And he's like, go ahead. I don't even care. And they had to beg him just to come with them. Does that sound like Elijah's running a school of the prophets? I don't know what kind of school that is when he's telling them just to go off on their own. And think about this. Even if, even if they wanted to learn from Elisha so much that they lived with them, there's nothing wrong with that. 
And I don't have a problem with that, that they're trying to get knowledge from him because he's a great teacher. He's got, you know, he's got the spirit of the Lord. He's a great man of God. Yeah, you should be learning from somebody like that. But he's not setting up an institution. He's not creating some college or some school and, draw, and sending letters out to all the local congregation saying, send your children here to learn from Elisha. He's not doing that. If anything, these people just came to him and were burdening him because he's just like, you guys go ahead and do that. I'm just going to stay right here. And they had to talk him into coming. We never see anyone commanding or even suggesting, suggesting that this is the way that things ought to be done, that we need to build some school and that's how we're going to teach and train all these people to then go out and just start churches all over the world. No, it comes from within. It comes from locally. Now, of course, a pastor needs to meet qualifications in order to hold the office of a bishop. And it can't be a novice. Like I said before, I'm all for education. But the education literally is God's word. How well do you know the Bible? How well do you know scripture? There's so many people that get their degrees and start pastoring churches and they've only read their Bible maybe a few times. But they have their, their letters after their name. They have their accolades. They have their certificate that says that they graduated Bible college and that makes them ready for the job. Maybe off of the world standard. You know what? And that's the world standard too. I can't tell you how many people, and you know, I, it, it was interesting the day I understood this, and it was probably when I was in my early 20s, and I started to realize, when I started to see and hear about what certain people had done that I knew in high school, and what jobs they had gotten out, you know, after college or whatever, and some people just aren't that bright, and that's fine, and you know what, I, I mean, some people are just in, in many ways can be smarter than others and, and, and that's fine. God's gifted people different with different abilities and different skills and, and different things. But when I started to, to learn of people who become doctors, physicians, and I'm like, I know that person. They're not that smart. But they were able to get a degree. They're able to get a job. They're able to do the work. But I'll tell you what, that's not the person I want to go to when I'm having trouble. And it just shows you, you know what, a degree doesn't mean that much. It really doesn't. I mean, people want to make it sound like it's this great thing. And, oh, man, if you don't go to college and you're, you're going to be a loser, you're never going to succeed in life. But we saw last week on, on Sunday, that's not what success is anyways. Let's worry about the success in God's eyes and doing what's right. And, you know, there's a lot of people, I mean, and you could list famous people in this world that had this world success and this world's financial success and everything that the world looks to that never even finished like eighth grade or high school, let alone college. And that were extremely successful business people. Extremely successful. Don't buy into that lie if you need college. And, and you know what? Especially Bible college, I have no part of it. We don't believe that here. And, and you know what? Of all of the men of God that were called by him, I mentioned fishermen, you know, the disciples, all the other people, there is one person who had accolades. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. There's one person that had accolades, that had some kind of title and position that he held because of all his schooling and because of all his training and because of everything that he got as a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. The Apostle Paul. And let's see how much value the Apostle Paul put in all of his teaching and training and the, you know, learning from the rabbis and learning from the scribes and doing everything that he did in the institution of the Pharisees, which I believe would equate to the Bible college of today. Philippians 3, verse number 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And, and look, he's speaking foolishly because he's just talking about, hey, if you're going to brag in, your, in, in the flesh, right, in, in things that you've attained, 
in your flesh. Not spiritual things, just totally in your flesh. He's saying, you know what? I could brag even more when it comes to that stuff. Verse number five, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal. He said, oh, you want to talk about zeal? Persecuting the church. Yeah, I went after him. I actually did it. I didn't just preach against him. I went after him. Touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Of course, in their law. You got to lower the bar when you're trying to live by the law and think that you're, you're, you know, you're doing just fine. Seven, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. He's saying, actually, what seemed to be better for me, and it was gain, and people were looking at Paul and saying, oh, wow, Paul's really excelling. Look at how zealous he is. Look at how smart he is. Look at all, you know, look at all this stuff. He's, he is, he's a pedigreed Hebrew. He was circumcised on the eighth, you know, all these checklists. He says, that was loss for Christ. That was actually hindering and worse for the cause of Christ. Verse number eight, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. So I count it like dung. That stuff is, is worse than nothing. It's, it's excrement, it's dung, it's to be cast out. He said it means nothing. This is why we don't believe in sending people to Bible college. And this is why I didn't attend a Bible college, because I don't have to. I mean, the Bible says that we have a more sure word of prophecy. We're talking about even the disciples, Peter and James and John, when they saw Jesus Christ transfigured, they saw him. He said, we saw him in the mount with our own eyes, but we have a more sure word of prophecy in God's word, in the, more sure than even what they saw with their eyes. This is more sure. We have the mind of Christ in God's word. Let's study that. If you want to be an expert in anything, be an expert in the mind of Christ. And you can't fail and go wrong if you are expert in this. You don't need to know anything. And you know what? Foolishly, for a little while, when I, was, when I was getting ready to be sent out, I was thinking, man, I don't know enough. And I knew other people had known all these different facts and all these other things. I'm like, I don't know that stuff. You don't need to know that stuff. They might be some cool little trivia information or something that might, people might hear. and go, Oh, well, that's pretty cool. But you know what's really going to help people the most is what this book says. This is what matters more than anything. And you know what? You learn those things, it's fine. Like, I'm not, I'm not against just learning things in general, even just things of the world, so to speak. You know, things that just information that's true, that maybe it comes from outside of, the, of Scripture. But you don't need a degree in that stuff to teach people the Bible. You just need to know the Bible to teach people the Bible. So let's go back to 2 Kings. I have one more main point in this chapter. Right, okay, so in verse 14, that's where he, he sent his people to go inquire of the Lord. They went to hold of the prophetess who dwelt at the college. And since that word's only mentioned like two times in the Bible, I wanted to cover that tonight. Verse 15, And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read. So saying, yep, what you read, it's true. <laughs> this is God's response, right? Yep, I'm, I'm, the judgment's coming, right? You read it and it's going to happen. Verse number 17, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense on other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard. Because thine heart was tender. And look, this is what God wants. Because thine heart was tender. And thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord 
when thou heardest that I spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into the, thy grave in peace. And thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. Now, our response to God's word is important. And look, we need to understand God's a God of judgment. God's a judge. And he's not backing off of what he said the consequences are when you break his law. He said, this is what's going to happen. But whatever situation you may find yourself in doesn't mean you just throw up your hands and just say, well, I've already screwed up. I've already done this. I'm just going to give up now. Josiah could have read all this up and been like, well, we're screwed. I'm done with this. You know, forget it. You might, we might as well just, just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. He could have had that attitude, but he didn't. He decided, you know what? No, we're still going to do what's right. And you know what? His attitude was, you know, who knows what Hezekiah would have done. We saw what he already did when, when judgment was pronounced against him. Well, well it's good. It's not going to happen in my days. Josiah could have been like, sweet, it's not going to happen in my days, and then just stop serving God. But that's not what he did at all. We're going to read that in the next chapter. He, he continues to serve the Lord with, with, with zeal, with fervor. Even knowing that the judgment is going to come, you know he still does the right thing. Even if you have done something that you know, you know, God's merciful, but he's still going to come down for whatever, you still do what's right. Because you, you know what? God still can be merciful, but even if, even if you think that all is love, you know what? Just do what's right. Because God wants to see that tender heart. And you never know what God will end up doing. The judgment was still coming, but he spared Josiah. Josiah didn't have to go through that. Because of his own actions, because he decided to seek the Lord out, to, do, to, to receive God's word, and to act on it and to humble himself when he heard it, when he found out that they were wrong. He did all the right things. One last point, because we're talking about hold of the prophetess here. And I'm just going to briefly mention, I preached on this before, but just there's nothing wrong inherently with a prophetess. The word prophetess is used in a couple of different ways in the Bible, just you know, positive and negative. Okay. Now, a prophetess, she, she, this woman had the word of the Lord. When they inquired, God used her, right? And God uses women. God doesn't only use men to preach his word. But when I say that, to preach his word, there's a time and a place for everything. She was dwelling in the college. She wasn't at the temple preaching sermons everybody congregating together. She had the word of the Lord and she prophesied the word of the Lord. And praise God, that's good. We have other examples of, of prophetesses. Miriam was called a prophetess, the sister of Aaron. She's called in the Bible as a prophetess. So was Deborah in Judges. She was a prophetess. And there's, they're both good women. They're both serving God. They're both doing what's right on their end, right? Now, in Judges, Deborah was put in a situation because the man, Barak, didn't wa didn't, wasn't doing the job that God appointed him to do, and she was kind of having to, to act as he should have been acting. But that wasn't her fault, right? She was still, still being a prophetess. And there's even in, uh, in Luke... When Jesus was going to be born, the Bible talks about that the woman, remember there was a man and a woman that, that both were allowed to see Jesus. You know, the man was like, he was real old. And when he saw baby Jesus in the temple, how he's, he was basically saying how, you know, okay, my eyes have seen thy salvation. And like now he's ready to die because, because God's kept him alive just for that, for that honor of being able to see him. And then it says, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Acer. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And she was also used. So it calls her a prophetess. She, you know, it's a great title. There's nothing wrong with that. Even in the book of Acts, it says that uh, in, tw in Acts 21.8, 
And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which is one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And again, another good thing. And prophesy means they're preaching. They're preaching God's word. But what they're not doing is leading a church. They're not bishops. They're not pastors. They're not elders in, within the church. We should be prophesying all over the place. Men and women alike, prophets, prophetesses. But not within the church. 1 Timothy chapter 2 explains very, very clearly how the church is to be run. 1 Timothy 2.9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearl or costly ray, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And also in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, the Bible reads, Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Is it a shame for women to speak anywhere? No. But is it a shame for women to speak in the church? Yes. Again, what does the Bible just clearly say? Let's receive what God's word says and not make up excuses for it, not try to twist it, not try to explain it away. Well, if you knew Greek, it really means this. No, it really means what it says. It's not difficult to understand. My little children can understand what this verse means. They don't need any added instruction. The problem is with you being able to accept it. That's the problem. I don't mean you specifically. Verse 36, what came the word out of God from, came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. It's not just Paul's opinion when he says that the women are to keep silence in a church. We want women to be prophetesses in their proper, proper role. We want women to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and they can prophesy all day long. But when you come into the church, it's time to be silent. It's time to be in subjection. And, it, and, it's, and it's a shame to speak in the church. That's what scripture says. There's no contradiction. Let's just make sure we do things God's way. People want to take the examples of Miriam and Deborah and say, see, that's why we could have women preachers. Referring to like behind the pulpit in a church. It's like, no. No, it's not. Just because they're prophetess doesn't mean that they're, gonna, they're, they're, they're teaching to a congregation. They have the word of the Lord. And they should. Amen. Praise God. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for um, the clear instruction that you give us, Lord. Um, help us not to have hard hearts and stiff necks to not be able to receive your word or claim that they're difficult to understand when they're not. God, you gave it to us so simply. Help us just to be able to accept your words. Help us have a heart like Josiah had that, uh, that can recognize just right from wrong. And uh, if we're wrong on things, Lord, help us to, to get right with you. And God, we, we ask for your mercy upon us because I know we're not perfect, but, but Lord, we're, we're striving to know more about you. We have the heart of Josiah, I believe, here. We want to do what's right. We want to build the house of God. We want to do what we can possibly do, but Lord, we need to do it with knowledge. We need to do it with the proper instruction and that's where we really need you to step in and, and provide that knowledge and instruction for us. God, help me as a pastor to, to teach these things and to everybody else here and I, I pray uh, extra that, that you would help me to understand even more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.